the six conversations potential to me is to totally turn around the idea of what constitutes engagement. So this idea of six conversations are really pathways to accountability because most of my story make me a victim or make me guilty. The isolation is what we're working against. You say, well, what's transformation about? Well, without us being less isolated, whatever we have in mind, whether it's safety or money or goals or weight or anything, I don't have a chance on my own. And so in the first grade, I was taught that I was here to compete with my peers. Before that, I used to play with them. And then all of a sudden, we got grades. And I, was, I looked around, and I said, well, I need somebody to get a D or an F, because I'm a B student, and I don't want to work hard for it. And so we're so deeply individualistic, and that notion is in the culture. We know we're too individualistic. Lots of communal, communalism, collective. But we don't use a conversational tool to do something about it. And so I can go to a meeting on communalism, on how do we build this neighborhood, and it's still somebody talking, a lot of people listening, and problem solving. The task of leadership is a convening function. Whether it's a school, a business, or a neighborhood, the task of leadership is to convene people together, to have a conversation they're not used to having, with people they're not used to talking to. Now, if I really took that sentence seriously, everything would change. I would, cha I would talk to different people. I would not be worried about the stranger. I would say, I need a stranger to be surprised. Every time we run groups or lead things, people want to huddle together with people they came with and people they know about. As soon as you do that, you guarantee you're not going to be surprised because you think you know who those people are. Every school principal thinks, I know my children. Every boss says, I know my people. And bosses say, and I love my people, and I grow my people like gardeners. All this language is a story. I love organizations because they say, oh, we have to involve top management. And so you get a big gathering together and top management made a video. And on the video they say, hi, I'm really happy to be with you this morning on this important occasion. And I'm thinking, you're not here. <laughs> If I'm problem solving, if I'm, if I'm doing Vision 2022, you know, nothing's happened until I got to wait till 2022 to see if anything's happened. If I know I've created in this room an, an example of the world I want to inhabit. So you say, why do this? Because I need to experience the world that I want to inhabit. And I need it now, in this room, in this place, in this moment. And that's its only reward because it's true, the, the dominant narrative is so mandating, so blaming, so problem solving. So without each other, we don't have a shot. A lot of what this conversation does in a very fast way is help people overcome their sense of isolation. For all the times I've broken too many people into small groups, and uh, my, none of my family ever understood or understands what I did for a living. Except once my daughter Jennifer called me from college and says, Dad, my professor does what you do. And I said, what did he do? He said, well, he broke us into small groups. Mm -hmm. And so the whole idea is at this moment, it has to be an example of the, of the world I want to inhabit. When you ask people, to do one of these small groups and ask them what struck you. Don't ask them to report. Reports from small groups are the dullest things in the world. Because you, they're not only dull about what happened in a small group, but the person reporting is reporting on something that never happened. Every time I report on my small group discussion, I create another story for the world. It didn't really happen. They didn't really say that. And so you ask them what struck you. And so if I ask the world what struck you about this moment of this conversation, I'm inviting lightning into my life. Okay. Uh, I want to be struck by lightning because it takes that much to wake me up. And so these are lightning-ish questions. 
First is find somebody you don't know. Second is don't be helpful. To be helpful is to say, I know what's best for you. There's nothing crueler to think that I know what's best for you. Uh, I was terrified of having my own children. It's too big. I can't handle that responsibility. I wish I'd stop worrying so much about what they should do and find out who they were at a much earlier age. And I'm starting to get a glimmer now in their 50s. And so I think that do not be helpful. Don't give suggestions. Don't say to somebody, well, when I was your age, because that implies that I turned out fine. Why would I give you advice on something that essentially didn't work? Otherwise, who am I? Am I claiming victory? Uh, am I a boss? Am I really a role model? I asked the pastor, I said, how do you deal uh, with people's expectations of your parenting? And he said, it's very difficult. Many people are disappointed by the way I run this church because I break them into small groups all the time. We focus on gifts all the time. We ask the neighbors, what's working? What are you good at all the time? Poor neighborhood, what are you good at? All the rest of the time that pastor's been asking about deficiencies and it suddenly dawned on him that he was using that, that kind of charity is abusive. Because it reinforces the dominant story. And so him saying, what are you good at? What do you like to teach others? allows them to experience a different story in the neighborhood in which they live. And you can't measure a person by their average annual income. It means nothing about who they are. You can't call a person homeless. This is another example of a different narrative. There's no such thing as a homeless person. And that's not who they are. Uh, I don't go around saying, I'm Peter and I'm housed. <laughs> and so, and most good therapy follows Every good therapist around follows these ground. The purpose of therapy is only to help you take responsibility for your own life. It's not to tell you what to do with your life. It's just that we don't have a language for collective transformation. We have beautiful language for spiritual transformation. All right, we have beautiful language for therapeutic transformation. We have the faith community has amazing language of forgiveness and compassion. But it's all between me and God. It's all between me and the minister. It's between me and the teacher. And so to me, that's our work. That's why I've given my energy to a neighborhood, a business. Design Learning does that as a training business, consulting and training business to try to bring about systemic change. And most of the world will say, I love systemic change, but they start with the policy. They start with the program. They start with the legislation. They start with the school board mandating something, the hospital. And uh, that's not systemic change. That's just more individual change on a big scale. So I think our work with this is to say, is there a communal uh, methodology, way of gathering, language set. The six conversations potential to me is to totally turn around the idea of what constitutes engagement.